we will call to order this uh, is this regular meeting of the Superior Planning Commission? Yes. For April 3rd, 2012. Do you call the roll, please, please? There it goes. Okay. Uh, Chairperson John Craycraft? Here. Vice Chairperson Craig Prestesader. Commissioners Joanne Eaton? Here. Ian Elberson? Here. Cliff Paulson? Here. Paul Sarton? Here. Bob McCool? Here. Um, Rochelle Ripmaster? Tom Rooker? Present. Um, Connor Gray Fox? Here. No place for Alex. No place for Alex. All right, good. Um, well, this is uh, it's item two on the agenda. Item three public comment on consent agenda and non agenda items. And this would be a chance for the public to address the commission. If there were any public here to address, I think we could <laughs> safely say at the moment that there will be no comment on. Agenda or non agenda items. Um, moving on to item four, the consent agenda, the minutes of February 7th, 2012, and the minutes of February 21st. I'd like to entertain a motion to con approve the consent agenda. I yeah. saw well, we changes. Some. Well, we comments. I wasn't here at one of them, so I can't. I can vote on one, but not the other. So, okay. But we can do them individually. Right. Yeah, I'm the same way. So. I wasn't here for the seventh. Okay, so we're going to make a motion then to approve. Okay, I so move. Well, we're not, well okay. On so the first one. February so, seventh. Is that okay just to do them here individually? Yeah. Not a big deal. Okay. On February seventh. Okay, so we'll talk about the February seventh meeting. Um, so motion to approve the minutes by uh, Commissioner Eaton. Second by, Second by, by Commissioner Dicker. Um, were there any? That's a motion to approve the minutes. Does anyone right. have any comments? No. Okay. And then anyone who wasn't present can't vote. At the, at the, if they the choose minutes? not to vote because they weren't here, no. okay. they can abstain from the vote on that. Okay. That's perfectly. Fine. Do you do you know the attendance on that date? Like the seventh. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, everyone except uh, Commissioner Elberson. You're right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. So, all in favor of approving the minutes, please raise your hand. All opposed? Seeing none and one abstention. Commissioner Elberson. So, and then the approval. <coughs> you want to make the same motion? Commissioner Eaton on sure. February 21st minutes. Uh, I'll second. To approve. And second by Commissioner Ricker. Okay. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. uh, and those and that were absent were uh, Presti Sager, McCool, and McMaster. Okay. Right. All right. So, all in favor? Opposed? And abstain? Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. So, that concludes item four of the Fed agenda. Consent agenda. Item five on the minutes or the agenda tonight is discussion and consideration of the US 36 interchange improvement options. Does staff have a presentation? Yes. I have a presentation. I'll just introduce the presentation of that. Okay. Uh, part of the main code, the uh, planning commission has the job of, of reviewing major public improvements. And um, this is the US 36 McCaslin Boulevard interchange. It's a major public improvement that has been under discussion uh, with the town board and parts of DC DOT and, and Louisville, actually. And so our the town's superintendent of public works, Alec Aranello, is here to make a presentation uh, about the options for uh, improvements to the interchange uh, and I, as a result of the discussion here tonight, I think we'd like to have uh, some sort of a consensus or uh, say suggestions, whatever that we can come up with that you think is appropriate for Alex to uh, utilize as they continue to go forward uh, with the planning of this project. Alex, yeah, and that's or, that's pardon me. Yeah. Fred, that's our role in this. We'll be commenting on the public improvement project. 
Yes, right. commenting on basically, I think the options that they have, and okay. possibly uh, uh, maybe coming to a conclusion from your perspective. Okay. okay. Uh, again, my name is Alex Arnello. I'm public works superintendent. We have some of these lines. I'm going to run through a, a history of the McCaslin interchange, um, show you some shots from the past. If, uh, if you remember this, the turnpike was built in 1952, and I don't know how many recall this, but uh, this was the original configuration of the interchange with the Marshall with Dillon Road connecting to Marshall and you see the two loop concept if you can see on the two loop concept was back there but this was uh, only limited movements so you could um, get on the turnpike and you could get off but you couldn't really go to Boulder without <laughs> any of those movements so it was kind of a limited and the chasm was not built at that time so it was really focusing in on the east-west movements between Marshall and uh, Dillon. So then uh, in the 60s, McCaslin was extended, and this was made a full movement. So now you could get on, you have, the, you have ramps in either direction. Um, but it wasn't a straight through here. It was kind of convoluted again, still focusing on the east-west movements. <laughs> then in uh, Around 1980, uh, when the Centen Centennial Valley area was developed, they came in and uh, they actually paid for the upgrade of the of the turnpike to. Um, I have to need another another one here. You got another you got one. The there we go. So this is an interesting photo because you can see that the tight diamond ramps that we used to have, Marshall Road was still in place, and here's the the real line Marshall under construction at this point. And the, the Superior Marketplace was in construction. Superior Liquor is not there yet. Ice Arena is not there. So this was a tight diamond, and if you remember there, um, it had limited storage for the left turns. It was only store three, four cars in each direction. So as the Marketplace filled out, this became a real bottleneck, and, and the left turn uh, vehicles were spilling back and, and blocking uh, the uh, interchange ramps. We came in one night back in uh, early 2001, 2002, and restriped, took out, there used to be a median on the bridge, we took the median out so we could get uh, an, an additional lane so we could have, I think it was side-by-side -side left turn lanes. <coughs> and then um, in 2005, starting in 2003, designing the project, we added the, the southwest uh, loop, uh, Marshall was you know, in place by then, we took out the old Marshall, we added the, the park and ride and the bridge. So we did a number of, of things and really solved probably two thirds of the problems that we're having at the, at the interchange. Uh, but we only were able to get a, a single left turn on the existing uh, bridge. So that's how, how it was up to 2005. So when, when we actually were in the process of designing the improvements for the Southwest Loop, we had a plan to actually add a Northwest, a Northeast Loop, and we had, uh, you know, an IGA was uh, assigned with the city of Louisville to carry. That was the plan we had, like Southwest Loop and Northeast Loop, and we were going to go and try to get that approved. So we went through the CDOT process to get um, that approved and. And by that time, they were just starting the uh, US 36 EIS, started in 2003, it was completed in 2010. So it took seven years to uh, complete the, the US 36 EIS. So we're, we're in, the, in the beginning of the process, and CDOT said, look, we'll, we'll let you build the Southwest Loop, but the Northeast Loop, we're going to put that in hold because we don't know what the footprint of the turnpike is going to be. There were these, these plans for these super stops and stations in the middle and this wide footprint. Uh, for the turnpike, so they put us on hold, and so we uh, basically st 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 stood back. And, and our, our IGA with Louisville said, "All right, we'll wait till the EIS is complete, figure out what what matches the uh, EIS uh, recommendations, and then once it's complete, we'll either go and proceed with the Northeast Loop design and construction, or come up with some other alternatives." So in late 2010. When uh, 
Well, what happened in, with the EIS, they basically said they weren't going to support the Northeast Loop, and basically because it required, it required acquisition of private-owned property on uh, Louisville side, uh, and the space available to build the Northeast Loop wasn't, a, wasn't enough to provide an adequately designed uh, loop. And so they basically said, no, we don't want the loop. We recommend a dual left turn lane and to replace the bridge. <laughs> and this is the design that was included, the concept that was included in the EIS. And you notice this, if you count the lanes on the bridge, there are nine lanes on the bridge. The loop, the southwest loop was recommended to be a double loop. We had a triple left turn lap lane coming off the eastbound loop. Uh, we had a double uh, on, on lane ramp. We had the uh, uh, on ramp, the, ex, the exit, the uh, westbound exit lamp was a, a dual, a dual uh, ramp as well. There were also plans for raising the uh, vertical elevation of the turnpike to go up about 10, 13 feet uh, to provide for Coal Creek uh, floodplain. So a number of things are going on, and this is probably a $30, $40 million project. So that was the recommendation um, from the EIS, but they basically said, well, that's a long-range plan. We're going to proceed with phase one, which is the managed lane. Uh, just put the managed lane in. Someday, way off in the future, this is going to be the long-range plan. So when that happened, uh, when that was complete, we went to Louisville and said, we think the Northeast Loop can still fit. We'd like you to give it a try. Louisville basically said, no, we don't want the Northeast Loop. Our position is it's, it affects us. So we kind of stepped back and we, two communities basically said, all right, let's start a study, look at things from a fr fresh perspective based on what's happened, based on the EIS, and uh, assess the existing interchange operations, develop future traffic forecasts, uh, as, you, as you recall, the Verhey property now is open space. That occurred during that whole time. There's a number of things that happened. Let's evaluate uh, interchange design alternatives. Uh, let's look at maybe new road connections, other overpasses or under, underpasses connecting two communities, and then recommend a preferred alternative. So that's why we're here tonight. We're in the midst of this study. We've uh, come uh, quite a ways. We had a public open house uh, back on February 2nd. We've been developing a number of alternatives. So I'm going to present some of those tonight and present kind of the final two alternatives that we're down to. So the existing conditions, um, some of the issues we're having, and this, these photos, these next few photos are, were taken early in the morning, so not as much <laughs> traffic on here as, as you might expect. But this is, uh, you know, Louisville's over here, Superior's over here, here's the Southwest Loop. So we have uh, on the northbound left turn lane going to Boulder. We have, you know, queues that extend sometimes down to Marshall. Uh, on the uh, westbound on-ramp, we now have a ramp meter, and sometimes that extends back. Uh, we have uneven lane usage southbound through the interchange, because especially in the morning, people want to go on the loop, people want to go through on, to Superior. So down here, the in the innermost lane doesn't really get utilized. Everybody wants to be in the rightmost lane, so we're not having good lane utilization. In the afternoon, here's another shot looking uh, from Superior to, to Louisville, <laughs> and this is the, the eastbound off-ramp, and this is the issue we're having with people coming on, want to go through, and people coming over the bridge, wanting to turn right, and there's that weave that occurs that everybody looks thinks it's real dangerous. We don't really have a whole lot of accidents or serious accidents because they're low, low angle accidents, but everybody perceives that as a, as a problem. So for, we first uh, looked at traffic forecasts and we looked at the, the plans for the US 36 corridor. We basically took Dr. Cog's 2035 model, which incorporated uh, growth in the city of Louisville, town of Superior, and the Boulder County growth. Um, and had some of the Jefferson Parkway impacts. Jefferson Parkway corridor, the Northwest Corridor, is in Dr. Cox's model. Uh, the, the forecasts are fairly high. It anticipates that employment in Superior would, would quadruple, which 
hopefully the town center may because do that, but center? that'd be, yeah, it's basically a town center, whether that occurs, I mean, we're not, um, and about a 50% growth in uh, uh, land uses uh, in the, on the Superior side and on the Louisville side, anticipating cutting Go Phillips building out and so forth. Um, on the bridge, on the bridge there, we have about um, 40,000 vehicles per day right on the bridge, and that was forecast to go to about 67,000. So it's by quite when? a bit. By when? By 2035. 2035. So the, the long range forecasts are fairly fairly high, and that's what the uh, EIS was, was based on and some of the, these traffic cool forecasts that we're going to look at of whether these alternatives work or not are based on these long term forecasts. So we uh, started this process probably back uh, in late 2011. We agreed upon a scope of services, hired a consultant, and began to look at alternatives and traffic forecasts. So uh, we developed back then six potential design concepts. Uh, an interchange committee uh, composed of a couple of uh, town board members from Superior, a couple of city councilmen from, from Louisville, plus town manager and city staff and so forth, reviewed these alternatives, threw some out, uh, added one, and uh, carried three on for uh, detailed evaluation. We presented those concepts at the public uh, open house in, in February. So just to review the ones that we screened out, um, here's one where we had a, a wide diamond uh, where we'd have um, a new overpass. Uh, basically, this goes through the, uh, uh, what's this, uh, Sycamore. So it connects to Sycamore on the south and goes by Home Depot uh, on the north side. Um, and it has a ramp here getting on. So you, similar to um, Sheridan, you know, where Sheridan mm -hmm. goes through, and you can go through the Sheridan, and you can go on to 92nd. Yeah, it's similar to that kind of, kind of concept. This had uh, issues with EIS. We'd have to go back through the environmental process because it's a, a new alignment. Uh, had tra traffic operations concerns, and it was pretty costly. <clears throat> another one was a, a, a tight split diamond where we built another bridge right next to the old bridge. Didn't really <coughs> do a whole lot for traffic um, operations, so we threw that one out. <coughs> Here's a, um, a single point interchange. You see several of these around the metro area where you, you take the two inter intersections and kind of combine them into one. Uh, so you have uh, uh, a three phase traffic single just right right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problems with this is you almost have to, you have to blow out the whole bridge to make this work because you have to have you have to bring all the intersections okay. together. The other issue that that this has, that the DDI has, is that there's no straight through movements. So the RTD buses don't have a way to get through the, the uh, intersection. <coughs> so these are the ones that, that stayed in the process, was the, the roundabout alternative. Um, had some issues with the operation of life. I'll explain this in a minute. Had some land use impacts, because we get into this area here, which is some open space and, and some land use um, issues <coughs> on, on that side. Cost was actually is probably the most reasonable cost of, of any of the alternatives. And then this is the dual northbound left that we'll talk about. In this particular concept, it had a pedestrian bridge on, on one side. To make this work, uh, we could keep the existing bridge, but we'd have to take the box <coughs> off. In order to get the width for the vehicles, we'd have to take the walks off, and then so you'd have you have to do something with with pedestrians. In this concept, we, they thought, well, we'll put all the pedestrians on this side. Well, that wasn't going to work. So we further refined this, and we have pedestrian bridges on, on both sides. But we keep the existing bridge. <coughs> and then uh, this is the diverging diamond concept, and I'll talk talk about this uh, a little bit. We also looked at um, new, ro new roadway connections, uh, and there were two that Louisville wanted us to look at. One is a Dahlia extension. Here's Dahlia on, on the north of Dillon Road. Take that, and there's some vacant land here that CDOT owns. That's where the northwest loop was, northeast loop was going to go. Use that right away. 
come under the turnpike and connect up to, to Marshall. So that was, uh, we looked at that, and it did have, um, you know, not great potential. It, I think it drew about 7,000 vehicles from the, from the bridge. Um, and so it, it had, <coughs> at, th at first we thought, well, that's enough to really, with the DDI concept would, would help solve the long-term problem. The issue we're going to have with, with this particular one is that the CDOT now is, is revisiting the Cold Creek Bridge issue. Uh, when they did the EIS, they thought they'd have to raise the whole profile of, of the turnpike by 13 feet. Now they came back, well, uh, they looked at a less um, grandiose solution, and they're talking now about just adding, having uh, three box culverts, replacing the bridge. Right now it's a bridge, and just replacing with three 10 by 20 uh, foot box culverts. And they feel that that is going to prevent uh, Coal Creek from overtopping the turnpike. Right now, if Coal Creek floods, 100-year storm, water would go over the turnpike a couple of feet deep. So, Alex, is that when they, when CDOT does that, are they including development from the town of Superior in terms of the projected runoff from the development? Well, we don't, we haven't seen their, their flood analysis. Oh. And also what's happening now is that <coughs> we've, un, we're about to undertake a, uh, study of uh, Rock Creek and Coal Creek uh, drainage way uh, studies from State Highway 93 all the way through uh, Louisville, Erie, and Lafayette. So we're looking at that whole drainage area. Hmm. And we're going to be looking at that, you know, now that CDOT selected that alternative, what does that do to our floodplain issues? How much water can that carry? What's it going to do to the, the uh, Superior Town Center? Area. So, well, hopefully, all these things come together that we have that, that study's yeah, ongoing. That's a new one to me, but, yeah. Uh, that's done. Yeah. So that's that's going on, and we've we've asked those questions. We have all we've seen is this plan for the three box culverts. We haven't seen any kind of drainage or floodplain study to show how much water that can contain. What about this other study of taking of the drainage for those two creeks? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Who's doing that? Urban drainage. Well, urban drainage. Right, and we've, they've, we're just in the consultant selection process, so uh, we're going to be interviewing consultants in a couple of weeks. That's going to be uh, about a 48-week study, so it's not like we're going to have answers overnight. Probably not. I'm not sure if we'll have anything in terms of uh, the comp plan process from that, but over the next year, we'll, we'll be studying those issues. Okay. So that was the other, the, the other, let me go back here. So they're basically leaving the elevation of, of US 36 where it is today. They're not raising it by 10 or 13 feet. So if you think, so we have a 10 foot deep box culvert at Coal Creek. To go under the turnpike, you need probably a 16 to 18 foot hole to be able to pass trucks you know, down below. So you're down like four feet below Coal Creek. Now you're moving a little bit to the west, so you're going up in an elevation, but you end up the bottom of that of the Dahlia underpass would be about the same level as Coal Creek. So we have some issues with how you keep water out. You know, you may have to pump water. It could be a real expensive uh, situation. So you want that to be an underpass, not a bridge. Mm -hmm. Not a bridge. At the, the, well, so there's you could go over, sure, but we're up 16, 18 feet. One of Louisville's concern with Northeast Loop, you have this high wall up there, so now we'll, you're going to have this big bridge going over, and then how do you touch down? So you have you have some significant issues going up, up as well. So it's after looking at all those things, it, it doesn't appear that the Dahlia one is in our short-term plans. It may be something way down the road, but right now we don't think it's a, a possibility uh, for the interim solution. The other uh, alignment they looked at is extending Campus Drive. Here's a Vista Hospital. Campus Drive is right where uh, Monarch High School is. We're extending that over and connecting into the town center um, system. 
this did not pick up a whole lot of traffic, didn't do a whole lot for McCaslin. It picked up, you know, five or 6,000 vehicles, but it's not people that are, you know, that would have used McCaslin. I mean, because 88 kind of serves that corridor right now. So that didn't really solve the McCaslin traffic issue. So that was kind of discarded. So uh, we went with those three options, the public open house, I, I think in your packet, I. I uh, sent out the summary of the comments we received. These are just three major ones. Uh, the proposed design should meet or exceed the capacity of the Northeast Loop. We had a Northeast Loop design. We had real good operations, and so why not try to at least match that with any alternative you're looking at. The second was, it came out, and if you read those comments, the same comment is there five or six times. <coughs> this weave issue is just confusing, we don't like it, we feel it's unsafe, uh, it's going to cause issues, so do something about that. And then there's issues about queues from the bridge backing up to Marshall, and then obviously that affects a lot of uh, operations on Marshall and McCaslin. Those are major comments, a bunch of other ones that are in public open house. Um, the Northeast Loop, just to, because that came out, I just wanted to refresh your memory of what we were trying to do with the Northeast Loop. We, we couldn't really duplicate this over here because we would be into the parking lot. We would be into the area here. Mm -hmm. But we had this chunk of land that CDOT owns, so we tried to take advantage of that by coming off here, leaving the existing ramp in place, uh, and then going under, staying down, going under again, and coming back. From a visual standpoint, um, Here's the, again, the, if you had duplicated the loop, we would be back in this area. So we came down, there it is there. Come down, go under, stay under, and come back. So that was the, the concept of the Northeast Loop, take advantage of the property we had here to build a loop with similar operations. And basically what this was doing was taking this intersection and going from a three-phase intersection to a two-phase two intersection. By doing that, you free up uh, traffic for the northbound and southbound uh, movements as well as the, the westbound movement. So that was the concept. So we performed uh, uh, perform evaluations of the, basically the roundabout and the uh, north dual northbound lefts and the diverging diamond. Uh, intersection at, at various five-year intervals. We look at costs, and tonight we have some of the, the results of those uh, uh, evaluations. This is what the uh, dual left has evolved into. Here's the dual left going on to the uh, westbound ramp. We added a bridge on e each side to provide for the pedestrian movements. All right, here's your spaghetti bowl with the uh, mm -hmm. Diverging diamond. So what we do here is we take the northbound two lanes on the chasm, we cross them over the southbound lanes, so we have a traffic light here, and then we go northbound. So now instead of uh, the wet eastbound traffic having to stop to go to Louisville, this is a this is a yield condition here, yeah. and so the three lanes go across. And then to go onto uh, the turnpike, you have a free left turn movement. So basically, if you're going to Boulder, you stop once, and then you have kind of a free flowing situation onto uh, the turnpike. Conversely, the southbound traffic again stops once here, and then before we had the loop that was free flowing, now we have the southbound comes down mm -hmm. and stop here, and then they have a free left. Okay, so let me demonstrate a couple of things now. I can remember how to do this.
going to do left, uh, we're gonna sh what I'm going to show you here is um, the 2025 scenario, because by 2030, 30, it breaks down. So several things that, that we had to do to make this work um, with our traffic projections, you know, we have the superior marketplace, see they're kind of going through <laughs> off-road here, where we included a, the traffic from the town center. So they're coming in. We had to put a double left turn lane in the southbound direction. We have a triple left uh, on the eastbound Marshall, and we have a double left going northbound. So we have so much congestion from this area, from this um, uh, intersection, that kind of permeates through the, uh, the system. But you can see here the, the westbound off-ramp has issues. Southbound McCaslin from Dillon has issues. Here's the northbound left. This is the PM operation in 2025. If I showed you 2030, everything breaks down. So, so this is northbound, and we have, you know, you want queues here. We have these queues extending. Look at these queues on the eastbound ramp. So the, this is going to be the diverging diamond, and this is uh, the 2030 uh, scenario. A couple things we, we did um, in this, again, we have the triple left, we have double left southbound, and here's the, the uh, left turn coming off, staying on this side, and then they cross over here. Here you can see the northbound crossing over, and then Stop there, there we go. There's a left turn going on to the turnpike. What we're able to do here uh, for the uh, weave maneuver, uh, and something we didn't we didn't think that was going to we didn't the the consultants were able to do this because of the crossover. They designed a, a triple right, um, and if you think what happens here at this at this crossover intersection, we're holding back the southbound traffic. Right now, if you look at that bridge, they have 80 seconds of green time. There's a continuous stream coming off the bridge. So you're trying to make that right and merge into that traffic, and you just have this traffic coming over the, the bridge. So since we're stopping that, we're stopping the southbound traffic, and this is a 100-second cycle, so you, you're stopping at 45 seconds or so uh, during each phase. So you can stop that, hold them back, and then the triple right, you're also holding back the ramp, but then you're allowing all three lanes to go. So we're basically separating that. We don't have a merge uh, yield situation. We're separating it out by, by the traffic light. And so when those three lanes go, they don't have any conflicts. They just go and you take, uh, again, you take one lane, goes to the southbound left at Marshall. One lane would go through and the other lane would go to, uh, to Marshall. So we saw, I mean, this is one benefit we have with the diverging diamonds, we really can address that issue. Whereas with the northeast loop, we didn't do anything on that on the side of the uh, interchange, so we still had that problem with the, the merge. So that's one benefit of the diverging diamond that we didn't have before. So again, you can see this going. There's a lot of traffic, but you know nothing's really backing up into intersections like you had with the dual left. So this is this is 2030 traffic. Uh, question is asked, well. Can you go far further? And the real issues are some of the intersections, and you can you can make uh, some of the ramps. That, like here, we have a, a single lane uh, off ramp. There, you can make that double. You can signalize that, so you can add some capacity in other ways without widening the bridge. So we have the, the issue with the existing bridge. We had to do the same thing as dual left. We had to take the sidewalks off so we can get three lanes northbound, three lanes southbound, and we put the, the pedestrians on uh, separate bridges. And why is it, and what the cost 
of lighting the bridge is so absorbent that, that it's always uh, not considered, right? Well, um, we'll try and preserve that the existing structure without having to. <coughs> But you're adding the structure of a pedestrian bridge yeah. on the other side. Yeah, we thought, I mean, pedestrian so bridges, lighter weight. Yeah, there are a lot of weights, so there's not a, they're not as expensive. But you're preserving the bridge, Alex, is that because it's a relic or it's because the cost? So to just tear the whole cost. thing all out and, and well, cost. whatever you do then in terms of widening it, expanding it, I mean, which is done everywhere, um, the cost is just exorbitantly high. And then these other improvements is difficult mm -hmm. to tie it in. Right. And then other DDIs that, well, it's, and it's not many, there's only one. The one in Missouri actually crosses the pedestrians to the median. And the, oh. Yeah. So we're, we're leaving the pedestrians on, on the side. So it's a design yeah. issue. And I think that whole thing, once we get further into all these design issues, we have to look at it, the concept first, choose the concept, and then go further with the design and make those kind of... Uh, calls and from a design perspective. <clears throat> so here here was that triple left, triple right, and uh, again the three lanes are coming and we're holding back the southbound lanes so they can, actually it's these lanes here, so they can go all together. Is that ramp immediately to the left of where you were just pointing? Is, it, is that a bus only on ramp? Okay. The other things that we're, we're doing here, because we can't allow straight through movements, right. we said, well, what are we going to do with the, the buses? Mm -hmm. So this is the concept we look at. Can we grade separate the buses from the ramps? And so we're taking the ramp over, the off-ramp over the buses. So it would be under pad, the buses would go under the ramp. <clears throat> now, we've, this again, this is a design issue. The question is, why don't you just take the pedestrians over the ramp and, you know, let the, the pedestrians get on somewhere. If I can, you know, get, get on over here, get over here, and, and keep, you know, keep the buses, let the buses pull off, put the pedestrians over. It's easier on this side. On uh, over here, it's we're pretty tight on that side. So that's a design issue as we go through. So the other benefits we have, yes, this is expensive. Doing those it adds about five million dollars to the cost of, of this project, but it has significant benefits for bus riders. If you think about the buses, if they get caught at a traffic signal. They're working. They're waiting over a minute to to go through the uh, interchange. By having these great separations, every bus ride that goes through here is going to experience some uh, travel time savings, up to up to a minute, maybe 80 seconds going through. Significant uh, benefit for uh, bus riders. Uh, to me, I look at this, and um, I remember the vision we first had for uh, US 36 and the buses. We were, we were going to have this super stop, you know, that the buses just have to stop and go on and wouldn't have to go through any intersections. This is very close to that vision of what the, uh, the BRT was going to be. I look at what, what they've been proposing lately with let's do BRT instead of commuter rail. This is a BRT improvement. You know, it's $5 million, but it has big sa travel time savings. They're, they're talking about putting this Q-jump lane in. I, think, I don't know if you've seen that. They're spending 150000 200000 up here to say to get buses to the head of the line when buses make it through what are they saving a couple seconds per run mm -hmm. whereas this is saving a, you know a minute per run uh, for all the bus riders so there's significant um, benefits for the bus riders what happened to the BRT station in the middle of the road of the highway well that's that's our concern here if, if you have pedestrians waiting here and you have Traffic whizzing by here and traffic whizzing by on the other side, so it's it's a much more uncomfortable situation. For <coughs> so I, I favor this one, but I think there's probably a cheaper one if you want to go. And it's, these are the discussions we have to have with RTD. Okay, so here's here's some of the evaluation <coughs> measures. We we really came down to these two options. Um, 
the roundabout had some issues. I'll show you be, be in a minute here, but came down to dual left turn lane and a diverging diamond. And so we'll, I want to pr present some performance measures for those uh, concepts. Costs for the dual left would be about $3.7 million. And, then, and basically, it's for those pedestrian bridges. That each one, th those two bridges add about a million and a half. You don't have to deal with that. It'll only been about $2 million to, to do the double left. Um, the lifespan, um, as you saw on the dual left, it breaks down about in about 10 years. So it's a, it's a, it's a fairly reasonable cost, but only la takes you so far before things are breaking down. So the diverging diamond with the RTD improvements costs about $12 million. Um, and that's going to last uh, 15 years, another five years. Here you have benefits, and, and the benefits are based on travel time savings, uh, comparing the, the options over what is going on now. If you just did a no build, these are travel time savings. So through 2020, dual left, you know, has that cost and this benefit. So the benefit cost is about 3.3. The diverging diamond has a little less because the, the cost is so high initially, we're not getting super benefits in the first five years. Well, the first, yeah, in the first five years going through 2020. Mm -hmm. As you go farther out in time, we still have a benefit through 2025, 5.28. The diverging diamond is catching up. And then in 2030, we have a significant benefit because during that all that time, we have um, travel time savings over the, the no build. What they haven't, this is really only vehicle travel time savings. They didn't really factor any of the RTD bus ridership benefits. And I think that's a fallacy, you know, not a fallacy, but a deficiency in this particular analysis. Travel time savings, um, we asked for them to look at um, the amount of time going through the, the interchange and how that compares with the no build at the six-lane diverging diamond and compare that with the northeast loop because the, the comments at our open house said, compare this with the northeast loop. We had a gold standard there. Compare what it, you ever do against it. So these are, for various movements, just going to what we did is looked at the simulation and looked at just north of Marshall going through the uh, interchange to the north. What, what was the time going northbound, southbound, and then going from the superior side Getting on to the turnpike going to Boulder, and then from the coming from Denver going that back to uh, Superior. AM and PM. The green uh, shows the winner, so the Northeast Loop wins a couple of the movements, um, and then the diverging diamond wins a couple of movements. So it's about a wash between the diverging diamond and the Northeast Loop, and the reason why is that they're both basically. Uh, working on the same principle. They're trying to take the intersections and put them on two phase instead of three phase. So the Virgin Diamond has two phases at both intersections and so does the Northeast Loop. So they, they should be about the same. So in the summary uh, of the options, we, we carried them around about through, we cost it out, it was about $3 million, but it had significant issues um, over five years. And, and the reason why is that the westbound off-ramp as you're coming off the turnpike, that particular movement um, conflicts with the northbound through movement. The northbound through movement comes up and they don't have any left turns to kind of slow them up. So it's a continuous stream, the westbound can't get on and it backs up onto the turnpike. So it breaks down. So it, it's about, it will handle what's out there now, but in about five years that that backs up and we have traffic that backs up onto the main lane. The four-lane diverging diamond, uh, we looked at this because you wouldn't have to take the walks off. You can use the existing bridge and, and make it work and with minimal improvements and it would be very costly to, have to do that. The problem is if you think about it now, we have three southbound lanes on the bridge and we're going to two. Well, obviously we're going to have a problem, so it, it didn't work. Uh, in the very short term because we it's less lanes over the bridge. <coughs> so uh, the dual left of northbound ramps, again about $3.7 million. It needs the pedestrian bridges because to get that additional lane, we need to take off the walks. 
it's good for about 10 years, so it's a, a short-term option, and it's something that, you know, if that's all we can afford, at least it, it buys us some time. It doesn't have any effect on the RTD operations. The six-lane diverging diamond, this is a new innovative concept. Some may say it's a confusing concept, but it's, it's only been tried a couple times in the uh, country, but several, a uh, lot of entities are interested in the concept. CDOT would really like to try one here. Where is it now? Missouri, Utah, are the two states that I know that are up and operating. You, you're Salt, in Salt Lake? Hmm? In Salt Lake in Utah? Mm -hmm. So I think if you just Google Diverging Diamond, you'll see all the ones that are either in operation or being considered. So the price tag, you know, uh, it's, it's about 12.3 to do the grade separation for the bus ramps, to do, take the bridges, take the walks off, build the pedestrian bridges. Um, so it's a big price tag, but about $5 million is really due to the, the grade separated uh, bus ramps. It's good for about 15 years, uh, but it does reach capacity in 2030 with the design that we had. I think if we add some more lanes on the on the ramps, we may be able to get a little farther. It has similar operations to the Northeast Loop, and it, one thing it does do that none of the things we've looked at is addresses that um, McCaslin to Marshall Weave. It has major benefits to bus riders. So this is, we're implementing, we're not only improving traffic operations, we're solving our weave and we're getting uh, the bus riders great benefits here. So that's it. Um, but it, it does need probably a, a lengthy approval process. It's a new concept um, because <coughs> we're changing the point of access to US 36, we're putting the bus ramps in. If you remember, we went through a 1601 process when we built the Southwest Loop, so we'd have to go through that process, which would take about a year. There may be additional environmental work to be done. Um, one of the considerations we have here is that right now they're, they're thinking about phase two of the US 36 improvements, and it would be nice to get our concept or design included in this process. And what they're doing in May or June, they're actually going out for RFP. Right now they have an RFQ looking at qualified contractors. And then to those that they select, they're going to give an RFP basically saying, here's the design. You give us a cost and, and a method of doing it and a time frame. And um, based on that, it's basically a design build project that they were doing on phase one that they just awarded. So they want to go out and, and do the same thing and get going. So if we can get this project into the hopper, that contractor could give us prices, and we get better prices because it's all part of a larger project. If we just did the dual northbound dual left, probably slam dunk. It's in the EIS. It's not anything new. It's, we're implementing the EIS. Here it is. We don't need any any more approvals. The bridging diamond probably take a year to go through all the approval process. So that's one issue you need to look at. Okay, um, I'm done. Here's a, the next steps. Um, we, uh, we had a, a meeting of the interchange committee this morning. I can report on that, but uh, uh, Louisville was receptive to the diverging diamond as a long-term solution, at least the, the people that were at the committee. They still have to go to their board and, and uh, get the approvals and so forth. Um, Planning Commission is here. We uh, hope that you have enough information to make a recommendation. Certainly, you wanna, if you want to take some more time or whatever, but we're asking for your input. We're trying to schedule another public meeting to, now that we've got all this data collected, expose it again back to the uh, public and ask for the, their input. And then we want to go to the Louisville City Council and the Superior Town Board and try to come up with a united front. Let's agree on a, an alternative. Instead, instead of fighting, let's agree on something. Let's go to uh, the regional agencies uh, on a united front with a plan that, that the, both communities can buy into. So that's where we're headed. What's the, uh, in terms of construction, is this a complicated construction project or medium or not so bad? It's complicated because we have a 
bridge that we try to we have to keep open to traffic. That's the complicating factor. And so we're changing. Uh, we're going from a traditional um, intersection to in, two traditional intersections to these crossovers. So it'll be interesting. It's not going to be a <laughs> slam dunk. We haven't, we haven't thought that far because we're, we're looking at the concepts and then figure out how we're going to construct it as the, the next thing. Well, but it's easy to have that aspect to it. However, if someone else is building, you're probably learning from them. Right, we're going to figure out how they, they, they did it. Yeah. And kind of learn by, by their experience. I've got a question. Uh, I know phase one has just been recently approved. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, fill material being brought in to raise elevations between Sheridan and Boulder. <laughs> Has there been any consideration with how that's going to meld with this whole concept? Not, not yet. You know, we're trying to come up with a concept that we can agree upon once once it looks favorable from Louisville, CDOT, RTD, then we'll start, you know, trying to think. We've already started thinking about phase two and trying to say, look, if we want to get to phase two, we, ha we have to make this, some decisions here because it's possible we could still get into the window for, for phase two and then deal with those issues if there's cost savings. So right now we're, we have a window where we may have some cost savings just because there may be another major project coming along and a contractor that's doing that work that we can kind of piggyback on. There's a rumor on the street right now is there's going to be a big shortage of material, mm -hmm. film material available in the northern Denver area. Really? Okay. Tremendous. Well, in this, there's going to be some, if, if the great separations are built, there'll be some need for that. Can you go back to just the double, <coughs> the diverging diamond configuration? <coughs> That was the, uh, the actual uh, get diver. drawing. Yeah, drawing. Okay. So, what? Well, you didn't. We didn't really address the pedestrian safety through this. I'm just curious about how the how the pedestrians navigate. The so it's a concern that I think we really need to to address. But because now they're theoretically, if you're going to pass all the way through, it looks like you're crossing. You have four different crossings. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Four um, or four, four conflict points, right? You know, Somewhere. you know, here we have the same issue in that we have this free movement. Yes, that's so a, this, that's, a, that's the same. So that's, that'll be the same because you're crossing it here. This is stopped, mm -hmm. okay? So we're crossing that. We've taken away the free right here. Why would anybody want to go there? Hmm? Why would anybody want to go there? That's tough. To walk all the way across that? You betcha. You oh, yeah. That's what I'm wondering about. So another, and like the one in Missouri, what they did was here, they would cross the pedestrians here, get them to the middle, take them there, and then cross at the light. So they're not, they're not There's crossing. There's like two crossings. Hmm? There's like two crossings. At that yeah, point, right? but they're not, they're not crossing any um, free lefts. Mm. And there's We're, no, but in this case, we don't have room for the pedestrians down the middle. Right, and that would have been, we don't because we're trying to, you know, again, getting into your design, maybe, maybe it's, more cost effective to add add onto the bridge and put the pedestrians here. That's something I guess through the design process, how do pedestrians feel about going through this? And, and right, what about bikes? I mean, bikes don't feel very good either. <laughs> it's not very pleasant you know, uh, right now, and it won't be in, in the future. Although, you know, if we had if we had the median, I think it's a little bit safer because you, you're going with traffic flow here. That um, this is stopped here, so these guys can go across, and then they they cross at singles, whereas they don't have to cross any ramps. 
whereas the design we've come up with, they have the cross ramps, so they're they're at risk. Uh, other way, other things you could do is you could signalize those um, crossings and make the traffic stop. So those are the design issues. We don't have a whole lot of pedestrians, so it's not going to. Yeah, I was going to say, I guess that there's not really that many pedestrians and. But, so but there are some because buses stop on the bridge and people go from one side to the other yeah. and they're digging across. Yeah. Was, um, sorry. Yeah. Was, are there any traffic safety issues with this diverging diamond situation, like accident incidence rates established yet? Um, we haven't done that. I don't think they've been open long <coughs> enough, but that's certainly something we can try to research and see. I would I would assume that they are not any um, different because they're going from three phase to two phase. I would expect them to be safer. We still have we still have a lot of issues with the northbound left. And if you see some of the public comments, one comment was people are running this that we have that lag arrow at the northbound left, and people southbound are running it. And we've had a couple of accidents out there. With that situation, we had we had to go with um, the protected operation on that left, and that then we started getting cues. So if we didn't have that permitted operation, the interchange would operate a lot better. But we we had 20 accidents in 18 months just on that uh, left turn movement, and so we had to take action and, and put that protected left arrow in there. So we've, we we. Uh, Solve the safety problem, although we're still getting some accidents. But I would expect that uh, this would be safer <coughs> than what it is out there now. Is, is uh, drivers getting accustomed to this? Has that been looked at at all? I mean, all of a sudden you cross over and you all of a sudden you think you're in England. <laughs> you have to have a right hand drive car. Well, I have one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're good. Yeah. We have one, you know, video that kind of shows cars driving through, and it's it's like you're making a left turn, you know, up here. You're, you're uh -huh. kind of you're making a left turn sooner than you would instead of making it up here, you're making it down here. Uh, I think you're going to need some overhead signing and so forth to oh, yeah. to uh, get your Is that the make zone? your way out. <laughs> you found it, Missouri. Oh, Missouri. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's striped pretty mm -hmm. easy. The mediums look nice. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, medium. Just, pretty. I like the pedestrian down the middle thing. Mm -hmm. Do they have pedestrians on there? Pedestrians in the middle on that one, right? Pedestrians in the middle. Is yes. that what they have on that one? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. You can pull that out. Yeah, you can pull it up. Anyway, um, so can you go to the double left configuration? So I assume uh, you get, uh, there's been there was been conversation over time about the slip ramps, right? So a slip ramp that took you right off 36 into the marketplace, right? Well, but you you got across Marshall Road or something, right? You got across Marshall Road. I've see if I can. Shows it better. Don't have one in Marshall. Actually, I wouldn't if you could slip ramp right into, mm -hmm. right into the, the slip ramp. Would have to come over here to. Here's Marshall, right? Yeah. So yeah. So it's on the inside side of Marshall. You know, I've looked at um, an option. Here's Marshall, of taking relying Marshall through uh, Fifth. You know, bring it down through the roundabout. So you turn, kind of terminate Marshall back there, and then have the slip ramp come in, become where existing Marshall is over here. Oh, okay. But also to counterbalance that is to take a bridge over the turnpike to go to Bowman. But again, you're you're up and over. The, the problem with the slip ramp is that it's so close to here. You know, the people are going to lose want to get I was out here. I'm assuming one that went back west, just just the one that gets you off of 36 this way. 
Because that f helps fix this problem. That would, yeah, that would fix, fix yeah. that problem. And then, but then what about a slip ramp on But the it? thing is, you know, if you do that and then this, you're, you're helping. You're helping this down here. Because these people that are doing this can now do that. True, true, true. Yeah, that, and then the other one was uh, an eastbound slip ramp that gets you onto the turnpike at Marshall Road down here, right? Or where? Well, I guess it's down there. there. To put you on the turnpike. That doesn't. This isn't really the problem, though, is it? No. The problem, as it was explained to me, is you, in both those cases of the slip ramps, you've got two-way traffic. So, coming off the slip ramp this way, you have to signalize it, or you know, they have to come and then make a left or right on Marshall. You can't just slip on to Marshall because no. We're, so that's what we're saying. It's, it's inside the. It's inside Marshall Road. So you don't actually cross the Marshall Road. You come right into. Well, I, I would terminate Marshall Road. Right. You have to. Yeah, you have to realign Marshall. Right. To do that. And then the same thing getting on. You still have to cross. Do something down yeah. there. Unless. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I was just. <clears throat> I know that doesn't really fix all the problems, but. Um, and then what's the. What's Fast Track's latest? Decision related to the hybrid, the hybrid or commuter rail. Is that what it is? It, is it, did they go, decide on the commuter rail? I thought that's what. On the hybrid analysis, they'll build some of the, they'll build commuter rail to Church Ranch, and then uh, sometime in the future down the road they ex extend the commuter oh, so rail. It's just but it'll still be but bus rapid transit or something all the way to Boulder, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, always have a BRT. Yeah. Always. Never right, we'll never have a train here. Right? Kind of so, well, that that so there's no option, though, then, of, of, a, of realigning 36 to, to to run wide in both cases with the, with the exits on and off in the kind of that double diamond configuration right in the middle. The uh, single point interchange? Yeah. Well, that was an option that was thrown out early in the uh, discussion. You, you could do that now because you're up, you, you just have the bridge. You leave it where this is now and just have the ramps that, that come in. Oh, yeah, you could just have ramps that come in like that, right? Right. But that's not an option. Right? Well, we threw it out because it was, we figured it would be $25, 30000000 million. And, yet, and then you, that isn't even with the solving the bus. You still have the bus issue, too. Right, you just the bus don't have the through through capability, right? Well, I guess I was thinking that the bus uh, the bus rapid transit would be in a center. Well, the original concept was to have the super stop. Right, have the super stop. Right, have, have buses stop here and let, let let off passengers and let them take the go up the stairs to the bridge. The problem, right. the problem that happened with that was that you had the HOV lane with the bus lane, so you'd have to build a bus stop and you'd have to have the lane going around it. So you'd essentially have to have two additional lanes plus the buffer separations with that. So it, it ended up being a very huge footprint to be able to accommodate all that. And so they threw it out during the EIS process. <coughs> That was that was the two billion dollar. Well, seeing, seeing that that website that that Bob's looking at, which is the Missouri double diamond, makes you believe that's a pretty viable concept, right? Yeah, yeah. And, no, it's, and it's, yeah. it's pretty slick. Um, and so, and I think I think as long as you could deal with it. The bicycle conflict across the McCaslin somehow, because I think, like you said, pedestrian-wise, I mean, I don't know how many pedestrians really cross there or not. You tell me, but of course, maybe it's because so many are scared to. But <laughs> yeah, they'll be terrified after this. So. But uh, I think, <clears throat> but but cyclists, you know, um, maybe it's not any worse for cyclists. <laughs> for at least a road biker. Passes or maybe under that free le uh, left, I don't know, can you make 
Well, you could make you, you could make the pedestrian bridges. You know, t you know, right now what do you have a six foot walk? So it's pretty hard for bikes and, and peds to to utilize that. You could go to a ten foot wide crossing and at least have it more comfortable for bikes to actually use that and get off and not go over the bridge. Alex, what's the condition of that bridge right now? Oh, it was built in, see that? It was built in the 80s, okay. so it's almost 30 years old, and it probably has another 30 years of life to it. It's, it's been inspected, and, and it's not ready to come down. Right. Well, I was just going to ask the question because they're all rated. Mm -hmm. All the bridges are mm -hmm. classification mm -hmm. So we're saving something that's worthwhile saving. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. I have one, John. Yeah. Uh, with all the spaghetti or whatever, it doesn't seem to be like uh, that it probably complicates it more or less. Okay. Fred, can you? But I'm trying to. I'm can trying to. Uh, sorry. I'm thinking about the town center, how you link, you know, the things that, you know, back and forth. Um, I don't know if any of this makes it any more complicated than it is right now if we left it the way it was to try to link both sides together. With, we've never even tried to deal with that, that problem at all, but it's something to, to think about, but I'm not sure. You know, that's the way how far the south this extends that we're, we still end up with the psalms the same magnitude of problem that we have now or am i wrong about that you but on? you haven't you guys haven't thought about about that about to a degree about how to get whatever let's say you have a town center we have pedestrians over there they're trying to get the brt how does that work for people who you know so they can get over to that brt in a in an efficient manner. Um, I don't think this, even though it looks complicated, I don't think it it probably makes much difference because it's about the same level of problem. I mean, uh, on either option? Yeah, either yeah. option. The, the EIS. Alex, what's the, so what's the funding mechanism here? I mean, is, is this, is this, are these improvements intended to be split between Louisville and Superior? Or is there some CDOT money? You don't have to worry about that. That's not your. <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm not asking. I'm not asking. It. Uh, yeah, I'm asking. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, is it, it? It. But is it? Is there CDOT money that's participating in this? Uh, yeah. Let me just answer this question. Yeah. I'll look at that. You know, the original um, EIS contemplated an underpass, uh, a McCaslin on that side. So from the town center. You know, here's here's a bike path, and this is still in the plan. This is actually in phase. Uh, I think this is in phase one, right. building this the, the bikeway. Bikeway. Right. So it, you know, goes to Coal Creek. So from the town center, you could bike at least to this side to get to a, a, a stop without having to cross McCaslin. Right. We still have we still have our problem over here of how to how to do it, and it's certainly something that it, right now is. It's a pretty tough situation, and we're contemplating crossing at Marshall, mm -hmm. you know, at the signalized intersection at Marshall. And, and when you do that, you're really going to mess traffic up because you've got to <laughs> cross a wide intersection with the pedestrian phase. Going back to your... Well, I, I, you know, there's something to think about because if, for example, the town board decides to go through with this zoning, issue over across the way for the town center, it would seem to me that a question there would be, well, if you're going to build that, or if you want the zoning, what's the accommodation for linkages back and forth? I mean, that to me is a question that somebody should ask besides me. Um, because it would be, it should be to some degree, if it's important to everybody, should be included at least in such a some degree in the zoning document that developers coming in the future are going to have to deal with that issue um, as the project you know, starts to get developed as it expands and, if, and so I'm raising it only so that we think about and people are like you're all involved in the 
transportation part, think about how that can link up with some concepts, because maybe those concepts should be included in the PD zone plan. I don't want to make life more complicated than it is, but... Well, we do have great separation on the calves and the animal culprit. Right. So, Fred, this, this did come up, I think, in the comp plan discussion last night. Um, to some degree, yeah. To some degree, moving moving pedestrians back and forth across right. McCaslin and under 36 potentially. Right. So I, 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 I hope happens, we address it there as well. If this happens, the Planning Commission will be involved in reviewing that zoning plan somewhere down the line in this year. So trying to get this stuff married together a little bit would probably be, be worthwhile. We need your expertise into how to mm -hmm. help with that. That's a <coughs> concept concepts and that we might suggest in the zoning um, And certainly uh, one opportunity we have with the DDI is to go back to that. What did the pedestrian bridge, the RTD pedestrian bridge cost? The one that's, what was the total cost four, of that? Four million. Anybody know? Four million. Four? Yeah. That's four million. Million. And so you're talking about five million just or how much, and how much was it to add the two to to widen this bridge to accommodate pedestrians? What's the difference? Of, the that two, 12, the, of that twelve million, the two pedestrian bridges are going to cost cost about a million and a half. Okay, right. together. Trying to look at here, um, you know, we're moving this a little bit farther to the north. I mean, there could be an opportunity, you know, right in here to provide a, a crossing, and especially if we made this more open, I guess. You know, we have an opportunity now with the geometrics, rather than putting in a tunnel under 100 feet of pavement, right. you know, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe daylighting a little bit. So there's, there could be an opportunity, I, you know, on this side, I'm not sure how it is. I'm just wanted to go back to this because I know we're moving the intersection there may be an opportunity some, somewhere around down here or in this, in this area here. We do have, you know, we have a drainage issue. We have, this is depressed, so there's some grade we can take care of, you know. So we get it here so far, then we down, down here. We have to make all the drainage work, so it's a good thing to, to think about and brainstorm yeah. a little bit. So uh, this, this solution, <coughs> Excuse me, it meets the 2035 traffic. 2030. 2030? 2035. 2030. It's at capacity of 2030. That's what the consultants thought. Again, 2035 projections, there's issues, but I personally think the traffic forecasts are a little bit high. I wanted to get back to your question about well, how do you fund this? Yeah. Okay. I think that's what you, mm -hmm. you, you asked. Um, from our standpoint, um, you know, if you take the RTD cost out, the, not, the bus improvement cost out, take that $5 million out, we're at $7 million to solve the traffic issues. That's three and a half split. The, the agreement we have is that we would split with Louisville the cost of the next phase. So three and a half million dollars certainly is not something we're scared of. I think we have more money in the bank from the interchange funding that we've had. Sure. So it's certainly not something. Louisville doesn't have any money at this point, and they're looking to us to upfront it and for them to pay us back or for them to to take their costs to fund their share off the sales tax that they would have gotten from the town center. The, the kicker, so I, if we're just looking at $7 million, I think it's doable from our standpoint and, and from their standpoint. It's the the extra five million. Yeah, the five, and you think, but you yeah. don't think RTD is going to contribute? Well, that? we're 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 saying. I mean, I, I look at it. You know, we're doing a big favor. We're, we're really the extra five million is to benefit buses. And it's not, yeah, it's not benefiting us, right? Right. And we could go if we united on our recommendation. We can go to RTD, CDOT, and Dr. Cox. Say, hey, we had mo we had money. Let me go back. There was money budgeted through Dr. Cog for the Northeast Loop. That was budgeted in the tip from like five or six years ago, and that money was held until the EIS. Right. It was kind of Dr. Cox said, you know, "What are you going to do here? You have this money. We need to allocate it to someone else because you're not using it." They took it back. 
So we have that ship to call in. Um, we have RTD, we have CDOT that, that may be receptive to building one of these. So to get the $5 million, if we're all united, I mean, there, there could be a pretty good chance. But it's it takes a while to get programming and to get all the funding of pools and so forth. So that, that could take two, three years to get all that stuff in, in, um, in process. So is there, there's no solution, at least that's designed today, that meets something longer than a 15-year impact or so, right? Well, we uh, at that point, the bridge is old enough that we just blow out the bridge. And <laughs> <laughs> that's not 30 years. <laughs> yeah, that's not the 30-year Not 30 years. Not <laughs> you know, the other, the other discussion we had is that what's probably driving this is not the bridge itself. It's, it's Marshall and McCaslin, and it's Dillon and McCaslin that those two intersections really start to get way more traffic to the interchange. you got to go through those two intersections, and they they can't handle a whole lot more. You know, we've done, we have triple lefts on Marshall. We've got double lefts on the other approaches. So we're pretty well maxed out at Marshall and McCaslin. So any more growth, <laughs> the growth in Dr. Cox's forecast, we can't handle it. Marshall and McCaslin and Louisville can't handle it. Dillon and McCaslin. So, if you can't get traffic to it, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, no one will be able to use the bridge because there's going to be gridlock on either side. <laughs> so I think we'll face the Marshall McCaslin issue long before we face the capacity issues on the bridge. And was, it, was that bridge really designed for cars backing up on that diverging diamond to be parked? Because that was the one thing I could see, too, that would be a problem with that. Because you have those lights and you're waiting for the the diverging diamond, the signal change mm -hmm. direction. You've got all that backup happening. There's a lot of traffic. Uh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, from the simulations, it seems to work work pretty well. And, and it's really, you're, you're throwing traffic for Marshall down here. You've got the triple left coming in. You've got any more traffic coming in here. This, this signal is going to back up into that before right. this backs up the other way. I'm talking about the stuff going north and south across the bridge and it waiting on opposite sides of the bridge for the mm -hmm. signal to change. Mm -hmm. Does it back up or is it? it yeah, it will back up. Mm -hmm. Has that been taken into account too? Yeah, I mean, it, it was. You know, we got, you know, we can do things here with double lefts and so forth because you can make these two southbound lanes, if there's a lot more traffic going to Denver, you can make that a double <coughs> left. And vice versa here, you can make this a double left. So there's, there's other things we can do that we haven't tested to go through. We just tested this particular design. Sure. Okay. Questions or comments? Anything else? <laughs> it's an interesting comment. I'm glad the roundabout got kind of put yeah. down low yeah, on the that list. That looked very, very confusing. Yeah, it would have been a triple roundabout. No. I can see that coming in a major accident prone intersection, so that didn't make sense. So I think you're just down to two choices. So regarding pedestrians, is, is, would there be any opportunity to take advantage of the, the Coal Creek Trail linkage? And since we're not going to touch that property just to the north of the ramp, bring pedestrians, at least from the town center, through the Coal Creek Trail, but then Turn them left, back up into loop. Yet yeah, along that area, we're not allowed to put the loop in, right? <laughs> this is can, be, can, can there be a trail built here? Okay, that could connect to the Coal Creek Trail. Yeah, that would be good. Okay. That would be built uh, with phase one of the turnpike. Okay, okay. That's, okay, that's being built here, but they're crossing. They're crossing at grade, you know, at the Singlize intersection. Okay. So we would ask either you make a recommendation, choose one of these, or if you want to delay it and come back if you need more information. But we're this may be a train that's uh, heading down the, the pike. So, do you have uh, any idea what the impact on cost would be if we move the pedestrians down the center and have to expand that bridge to accommodate that? If you widen the bridge, if you widen the bridge to accommodate pedestrians going down the middle, 
which means you have to you, know, you would have to expand the bridge enough to handle a lane of traffic, right? At yeah, I, I would say may add a million, two million dollars because you're replacing the pedestrian bridge with a vehicle bridge, so you have to have you know probably a different structure, and it's not a separate one; it has to be uh, adjacent to it. So there'll be some costs, but it's, it's significant. I mean, that's something you may want to weigh in on. Be 10, 20 percent. So it seemed like that doesn't affect. I mean, it's better, considerably better than it is today, because you've got four crossings you're dealing with, or three, three or four, depending, I guess, which side you're on today. Whereas with this, if you if you put people down the middle, then you'd have two crossings. You have two crossings. So, so we actually, which is better than most bridges like this, I mean, where you often have two or three, depending on. Right, and you don't have conf conflicting movements because when you're. Right. When you you're cross in one way, you're, you're going. You're going with in the direction of traffic. No one's crossing against you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you when you're traveling, yeah. You, yeah. You've only got traffic. Coming. And you're losing the expense on both sides. You're mm -hmm. basically taking that, putting it all right. to the middle. Right. So, yeah. So you're you're yeah. taking that and you're building. You know, you're putting another span or whatever on it. Right. And to me, that was how I uh, how I initially envisioned this with mm -hmm. the pedestrians in the middle. In the but the middle. consultants came up with these pedestrians on the side, and I I still kind of question that. So I mean, that that certainly is something that you can forward on is with your comments. Yeah, I mean, that, that seems to be my, my biggest concern about this was the pedestrian movement. And if you could address that the way they did on that Missouri. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you're walking down the center of the bridge with traffic on both sides. Is that it's a better experience? It may, be a little, it may be a little unsettling, but at least it's, it's like, it's, although it's like being a pedestrian in England, you just got to make sure you don't look the right way. <laughs> you step off the curb, right? <laughs> Um, well, I think if you're a pedestrian, you're not going to be an odd pedestrian. You're someone that's going to get used to using that particular span. Mm -hmm. And so you become more familiar with what you have to be more cautious about. Yeah, it isn't a casual. The, the, the no, it's not a right. right. well, yeah. casual. Some people do. They had some median separation or something, too, right? Oh, yeah, they were like, it looks like there's... It's there's like guard. It's there's guard. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. Good, yeah. good three, four. I mean, if you're going to spend the money, that's right, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. as well. Yeah. Try to avoid all the accidents. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you separate it, it cuts down on what I call conf driver confusion. Mm -hmm. You're doing something that's kind of diametric to normal traffic. Let me do it by mm -hmm. doing what? By 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 widening that that area between the two switch over lanes. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're basically going to left or. You're, you're sort of disguising what you're kind I mean, of disguising. I mean, I think when you're driving, you're going to follow what the road does. Well, you, you, know? I mean, you drive by the lanes, right? Yeah, you're yeah. just going to follow the lanes. Right. Yeah. And I think, but with the pedestrians down the middle, you sort of don't see but the this, other side very easily. It's sort of, it is sort of elegant. Yeah, it, yeah, it is. That elegant. You, you know, you, you, you have one stop light, and then you, you're actually on unimpeded onto 36 or whatever. Right? Yeah. And that's pretty slick. Yeah, I think yeah. it's pretty cool. I think we should recommend that that we would like to forward this one. The double. I've liked it since I saw it at the meeting. It's it just mm -hmm. more I've thought about it, looked at it, talked to people about it. It just seems if we're not gonna get the loop, that's the well, maybe even equally the same. I mean, they're trying to to visualize that it's or, or conceptualize that it's that it's truly the same. Mm -hmm. well, I think the added benefit, loops, like you said, of the. I think it the, is. Uh, I just like the pointer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is, this, is this crossover, the weave, it, it, it addresses that right. unexpectedly, right? Uh, again, yeah. uh, you need to realize the trade-off we have. Now we're going to have more delays on that eastbound ramp. The, the people are going to have to stop and wait for a light to change. Whereas now they're coming in with oh, light traffic, they just proceed on, no delay. Uh, yeah, but instead of this loop here. Yeah, I mean, right now that they're coming off in light traffic, these guys kind of have a free. If you're going to Marshall, that's a free ride, no delay. Well, now no, if you go to Marshall, I was delayed tonight. That's why I was late. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, not, it's not supposed to be. There's a yield sign there. <laughs> right, but it's. How many people pay attention to it? Yeah, not yeah. many. The people but, were dead to it. But here coming in, yeah. some people do. Yeah. You, you know, if you don't hit the light, you're going to wait for you know 50 seconds so, or so. So that light is a, so that that's not a free ride. That's a light. That's right a light. there. Everybody, oh, yeah. everybody, everybody stops. So the cars will queue up here. 
Yeah. Right. Through. Right. But, but, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the right will queue up more than it does now. Right now, you have to sit there for 80 seconds. If you didn't get the light, you have to sit there. It's a hundred second cycle, and you get maybe 10, you get 15, 20 to the side street. So, you know, the left, the left turning traffic is is queuing up, but not not the right turning. But during the the pink on hours, to mm -hmm. yeah. onto Marshall or off no. off the on ramp here. Yeah. Off the on ramp, yeah. Yeah. But the times when, you, when that yield guy can't get a gap, he sits there, and then people behind him, you know, they So Louisville then gets on to 36 via the the ramp we're using now. Okay, okay. so that changes it. They're right. Their loop goes away. Okay, and RTD gets part of that. So then RTD would be able to use the, the portion, at least, of the road that's there now. <coughs> you have to reconstruct that portion. Right. And, and this is on. this is not a, you know, this is tricky here. It is. I mean, we have some drainage issues here, so we have to go down into an area that we have drainage issues. This is this is pretty tricky too mm -hmm. to be able to get that under. So would it be easier? Would it be easier to bring the buses to the north of the roadway and have pedestrians go underneath? That would be the same is that what you're saying? Across the pedestrians. Are okay, across the pedestrians instead of the, the buses. Okay. You know, that's something we would discuss with RTD. This is. This makes the vehicles, you know, go through. You know, if you think of the pedestrians going under or over, you may have to go down two flights of stairs instead of one flight yeah. to be able to be able to get to. Yeah, uh, parking ride's pretty slow. Yeah, you're already, yeah, you're already coming down half a story. All right, so Commissioner Eaton has weighed in on it, on her preference. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, I'm really torn. You know, at my age, I think, do I want to really try something new like that? <laughs> no, there's only two in the country. I, I'm just really torn. Um, my first preference when I saw this come across was the double left, because I know a double left. I know how a double left works. I don't like a triple left, but I do like a double left. Um, so, we, I, do we get 10 years out of the double left? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we get 15 out of this. Yeah. So I, I guess that would be my preference is, is the double left because I do understand it more even though this looks great. I know it and it solves a lot of problems that we already have. So, but that's my mm -hmm. say. So. Perfectly rational. <laughs> I like the diverging diamond, but like like Phyllis, I am concerned about the complexity of making it happen versus the simplicity of making the double left happen, the much lower costs and the, and the benefits. I guess if money was no object, I would say go with the diverging diamond, but time, time, time and, and money. And time and money, because it's, as you pointed out, it's going to take additional. years of, of additional approvals Although, I think now we've got some time, because it's going to be years before anything happens across the street, so maybe we, we take advantage of that time and, mm -hmm. and do what's going to buy us a longer yeah. benefit in the long run. What if, what, what if you spent the money for, for to widen the bridge? If you were going to spend the money to widen the bridge anyway, for the double diamond, what if you just widen the bridge, widen up, you know, to improve the, the double left situation? I mean, what does that get you? If you're going to spend seven million dollars anyway, I don't know. I mean, you, you, you're going to create some sort of pedestrian improvement, right? Oh, that's what why we're here. I mean, that's right. That's what. I mean, the board uh, really is looking for something that's comparable to the Northeast Loop. And if we're going to do some improvements, let's do it once and get over with. Get over and done with. And that's my question. Will, if we did the double left, and somewhere seven to ten years from now, we'd have to consider this whole thing all over again? Correct. Right. Well, you're going to have to do it in either ten years or fifteen years, no matter what, probably. If you believe in the growth pattern, 
<laughs> right, exactly. Kind of aggressive. If, you, if you believe the growth. Right? If you can get the traffic to it, right? <laughs> right. Through, through Marshall. Uh, yeah. It would be a nice problem to have is more traffic coming out of the marketplace than we could ever possibly yeah. handle, right? Yeah. And we don't have lots of money to do it if we need to exactly. do that, right? Yeah. So. And, and the reason we abandoned the northeast loop in the first place was because Louisville didn't want to do it? We didn't, yeah, we didn't abandon it. Louisville did. They said no. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just getting back to why we started looking at alternatives in the first place. Right. But that's essentially what we're talking about. Here. Yes, yeah. They wouldn't buy into it. They wouldn't buy, buy into it. Even though it was originally planned. That's right. You've got a big hunk of ground out there. It's owned by exactly. Scott, which is, they're going to unload someday. What is, what's the cost on the Northeast Loop? It's about se it was about $7 million when we estimated it two years ago. So it's it's comparable to the DDI road improvements. So if we, gave, if we gave Louisville, if we paid our half, which would be three and a half, plus we just gave them $3 million in cash to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, it's cheaper than spending $12 million on this. Right, right. Well, that's, that's what I was, I was looking at the cost, I know. Hey, it's just simply a matter of negotiation, right? If cash speaks loud, I don't know. Sorry. I guess if I want to do that, I should just run for it. Alex, <laughs> on, on that design for the Northeast Loop, it didn't really take any from the outback or anything because it's got that long, you know, it's kind of a long, long deal mm -hmm. to get to the CDOT property. But that was uh, the concern there was you're going a third of a mile the wrong way. Two yeah, actually ended up going almost a mile to get on the highway because you're going a third, two thirds of the mile, you have to go a third of a mile down, a third of a mile back to get back there, right? Yeah, I mean, we, we thought this, we didn't think we were impacting the, uh, yeah, two or three minutes. you know, the hotels. I mean, they certainly thought, you know, when we showed them the, the graphics that they, they thought there was a real impact. <laughs> they, they didn't think there was an impact? You can see the wall here. So yeah, you know, just don't like the wall. Yeah, I like the wall. 10, 15 feet. Oh, okay. But here's, we may end up with some of this wall anyway, because here's yeah. the, the bike path mm -hmm. that's right. probably going to be running now anyway. And that, that this is significantly higher. This was another concern, because you've taken any views now from up here, at least the second floor or the first floor. This is 10 feet, 12 feet. Oh. Raising that up. Quite but the problem was, is we were trying to match the elevation that they were going to go up they were because, raise of the bridge, the because of the bridge. Because of the bridge. So on, on the one hand, you wouldn't have this kind of wall, but could you even get under here because now this is lower? Uh, so are we going to have problems getting, getting under because that, that curve would be lower? Tom, do you have a preference? <laughs> well, that one there is the cheapest, but the diverging <laughs> diamond, I guess, is the one I guess I would prefer. Yeah, you know, the diverging diamond from a cost standpoint, from an operational standpoint, very equivalent to Northeast Loop. The big expense is, is for the buses, and we're making improvements to, right. to the, uh, the BRT operations. Yeah. Alex, it seems like that should last longer than five years, longer than double <clears throat> up. What, what, What's breaking down that, that there's only five more years of life out of the diverging diamond over the? I think it's more the traffic that's coming from Marshall, McCaslin, up, and uh, Dillon. There's just so much. It's probably on either side. It's not necessarily the diamond itself. Yeah, I don't think it's the diamond itself. And so, what would be the next? I mean, what would be the next thing you could do to get beyond that? What I mean, do you still need a diverging diamond, but you have to do other stuff? I mean, what what's what, what's after the diverging diamond? Yeah, you what? know, again, the, the, we've just got this information last few. You know, yeah. I had the same questions. Why is this yeah. breaking down in 2030, and why can't we do something to to make it last so, longer? Well, in, in understanding what we could do might help us decide what to do now. I mean, if we're talking about in 2035, the, you know, the bridge gets blown up, then we put another diverging diamond in just because we need a bigger bridge. Does that idea? I, I, where does it go from there? Yeah, where, what, I mean... If it doesn't, I mean, well, if it's the diverging diamond itself, you add a lane in each direction, and that should help. I so mean, it's we one. go from six to what? You go from six well, to seven or six to eight. And I don't think the solution. Six to eight, but I would, I would look at improvements to the ramps first. 
because we have some single lane ramps and we can make those double lane ramps. Okay, yeah, you mentioned that. So, so that could buy us a little more time. Right. Well, and there, and there could be other movements that we haven't even, that we didn't, that it isn't in the, ultimately in the analysis. So the, the, the conversation of connecting Marshall and, yeah, and, and, and Dahlia or whatever, right. those types of the, you know, future bridges or whatever. I think that was the discussion with the interchange committee. All right, we can't solve uh, the 2035 problem, but maybe the solution is Dahlia or some other connection between the two communities mm -hmm. that, that we get uh, enough traffic off that 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 McCaslin alignment is is not so congested. I mean, 67,000 vehicles going across the bridge. Sounds like a lot to me. It's a, it's a lot to me, and and I kind of question those things, and I think that what's the current count? Forty. Forty thousand. Yeah. Well, if you had 2,000, if you had, if, if, if the existing comp plan, which calls for 2,000 residential units in the, in the, the new town center, if, if that happens, then, then yeah, you probably yeah. are going to hit that number. Well, you're going from, you know, we have 12,000 people now. We increased the town superior's population by 20. Well, 20 percent, yeah. 15, 20 percent. It's not doubling. It's, no, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And then you have the employment quadrupling. The superior's employment to me seems Which a lot. Isn't a big number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the other thing I wanted twelve to, employees. <laughs> to, uh, I wanted to test some of the some of these. Improvements. The other thing that that happens on on um, McCaslin North of Dillon, traffic's doubling on McCaslin North of Dillon. I'm going well. What's going on up there? That you should have that much traffic. Because you know Louisville is pretty much built out. Yeah. Again, you have Conoco Phillips is developing this traffic being pulled from the Boulder area. I think that to me, what what's really going on here is that Boulder doesn't want traffic on the Turnpike, and they've and they've kind of constrained it, and so traffic's trying oh, to we got Cherry Vale and no. South Boulder Road. Right. So traffic's getting on and off at McCaslin and avoiding the. Four level service on on US 36. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will I will bring up carry those conversations and, and at some point try to get those answers. Of what what so, can be so done I, I, to I go beyond? It, what you, in, I haven't, haven't asked you yet. So I'm I'm all for the diverging diamond. I just think it solves so many problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can't not go with it. So. It's basically five million dollars to to give us the the difference between the double left and the diverging diamond is how much about nine, about nine about nine eight eight point three million and that's primarily to give us the level of service like the loop I mean, it's giving us well, the freedom I mean, it gives us a lot more but I mean it's yeah. I think you're doubling the cost to get to the same level of service and then you're adding five million dollars to solve the bus issue. Going right. from double left, right. doubling that solves the traffic issue and gets it to the okay. northeast. Okay. You know, the other thing that, that in terms of dealing with RTD, we could not do anything with RTD. And let them, let them figure it out. Let them figure it out. Let them try to figure out how to get through the interchange. Yeah, I was going to ask that question. I just didn't know if that was a fair thing to do. <laughs> yeah, but totally, then one of the, they might have to go up and do a U turn. If you want my other idea, I can, <laughs> I can tell you what that is, but you promise not to repeat it. <laughs> this should be their problem. Right. I mean, we, we presented a solution that helps them out. They should help pay for that solution. Logic. So if the, let me just ask this question. If the traffic, if we don't believe the traffic counts, for instance, how far does that take the double left? Hmm. Years out? Yeah. Does that? And it, and it's obviously a hypothetical question too. You were sort of rolling the dice. Because well, you can't answer it. You know, can't no, answer it. I guess what I'm, I would say is that when you build a town center, yeah. I don't think the double left can handle the handle. town center. Yeah. It's going beyond. So it can't. It fails there when the town center is built. But then going beyond that, something else is going on that that I don't think is, may happen. Beyond the town center, what's going to happen with Superior? We're going to have a lot more traffic after after the town center is developed. Well, yeah, once the town center goes in, that weave becomes a nightmare because you have all those yeah. people trying to shoot over to get into the town center mm -hmm. off that ramp. Yeah. 
We'll just have double, double diverging diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Cross them back over again. I will have a huge mix match. Well, no, but you bring up a good. Well, we can bring a roundabout well, there. Sure. Except that, except that it's not weaving so much because it's a controlled light now. Yeah. No, but I mean, if we just did the double left and that weave is still not oh. addressed, yeah. as soon as yes. the town center comes in, you've got that many more people <laughs> trying to <laughs> race across <laughs> two lanes of traffic. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so then in, we don't have any accidents now. We'll have some at that point. Right. <laughs> yeah. So is it two lanes that we'll be hitting to Boulder off the diverging diamond if you're coming from here and going to Boulder? If you're going to, uh, to Boulder here? If you're going to, no, if you're coming from Superior, Going to Boulder, is it two lanes? Two lanes. They, they just said show one double. lane. It's one in the drawing, but it's continuous. Yeah. So it's only one continuous. Okay. Yeah, you know, like so that, that could be that could be improved to two continuous, right? Because right? mm -hmm. that that's oh, one place it would seem like that would be mm -hmm. a real potential bottleneck in if town center gets built. Because you still have the same issue. You got people trying to get across three lanes to get, you know, in the far left lane of the diverging diamond in order to go to Boulder, and I would. If you have two left, you also have the straight ahead off the... the yeah, the, yeah the one left can be straight or left. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Left. Straight or left, left. Straight or left. Okay. Well, I'm glad we got that cleared up. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, um, well, if I was to summarize where I think the, the commission is, that the majority seem to favor the, um, the, 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 the the divergent diamond, but are concerned about the cost and schedule impacts associated with the improvement. And, if, and so there, there's, there's something simple and quick in terms of effectiveness related to the double lefts. I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's... I wouldn't necessarily say a consensus because I think I, I see the benefits of the divergent diamond, but I think the simplicity and ease of approval and cost and everything of the double lefts is the simpler solution for the short term. And I think that it will last long enough until the next improvements needed. But, but <clears throat> so I don't know if I, did I summarize that? Mm -hmm. well enough. I think that's correct. And the double left doesn't preclude the eventual divergent diamond. Either. It's true. It's it's not like you're building something and then you got to tear a bunch of stuff out. You could modify it. I would say, given that, and if you were, if, if, if the decision was to move forward with the diverging diamond, we would definitely like to see that those pedestrian movements, movement addressed by Ideally, widening the bridge so that you could get that that pedestrian um, uh, walkway, uh, you know, sidewalk down the middle. <coughs> that would be that would that I think that would make it a more ideal solution. So, how's that for wishy-washy? <laughs> well, um, I mean, if you want, I, I don't know if you. If, the idea Do you guys want to give some more definitive? Well, how long will the single left? I mean, says, well, here's the double left's not going to handle the town center. So the town center can go. We have to have more than the double left because you don't even think the double left can handle the town center. Is that correct? Um, I hear that. No, right? Yeah, right. I mean, that's my, my hunch is that, is that when that's built out, that double left is really hard for us to handle. Oh, Alex, you need to come to the mic. Sorry, I know you're standing there. <laughs> you can sit, actually, you can sit there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that if the town center comes in, there's going to be real issues with the double left, probably right at the capacity of the double left. As uh, Ian mentioned, the weave, it will be a real issue at that point. Well, and the double left isn't going to solve the weave problems no. anyway. No. That will remain basically right. the same. Right. Now, if you have if you have Conical Phillips property being built out in the town center, I think yeah, that's on that's on indefinite hold. So, so 
two lanes. Are, are we at capacity with the single left? I mean, I know people complain about it, but I drive it every single day, and I think today was the first, and that was because it was snowing. People were just going slow. It was the first time I've ever waited for that left turn light twice. Yeah, I've never waited. I've twice. never, ever I've waited never for it. And I know we hear complaints about it, but That's I've so never wild. seen it. I mean, on the weekends, I've said, I don't. Well, I don't it's travel on the weekends. So I know the weekends are probably so a little, little bit worse, yeah. Um, but are we at capacity with that single one? We're um, occasionally in the morning uh, is our peak period on, on the double on the northbound left. People go into Boulder, and so we have occasionally we're backing up to, into Marshall. Whether we're at capacity or not, I think it's not a not a critical situation now. Well, my okay. point becomes why are, why do we? I mean, if we're gonna I mean if we're gonna spend money. What's the double left buying? Is are we are we, are we fixing anything that people that that are we really fixing a problem, a serious problem we have now? The serious problem that I understand we're trying to fix is the fact that we have to wait to make that left to go into Boulder. That they, you know, at least the town board and others who have talked about this, the intent of spending this money was to eliminate that left to improve the time that it takes to actually get on the highway and go to Boulder. And and which, are we going to gain which, that which much? Is Alex's very first point, which right. is he want they're trying try to find a, a solution that was equivalent to the right so now to, to the north why would we spend the money on a double left if we don't need to I mean why is that option in there I guess if we're gonna have to replace it when the town center gets built anyway and we don't have a I mean we have we have an annoying problem right now but not a serious problem we don't, right we don't have a problem single. now but if we if the town center gets built we have a single left we have, we, have, we have a problem with a double left too yeah. in your opinion mm -hmm. probably so why why spend the money to do the to double left? Why not leave it alone and then when we need to do the diverging do the diverging diamond? I, I I don't know why you would because then you I mean there's going to be some additional expense. I, I agree you could do the double left and and not lose a lot, but you are going to be spending the you're money to do the double the left money. and you're you're going to waste. Mm -hmm. You're going to yeah. spend the money on the double left and then you're going to add these pedestrian bridges on the sides. So right. <laughs> yeah. And then that stops you from putting yeah. the pedestrian down the middle if you switch over to a bridge. Right, exactly. Right. Right. Well, you have to expand the bridge to accommodate traffic if you're going to do the double left with the plan to go to the diverging diamond. You, you wouldn't want to just, I mean, if truly we're saying do the double left now with plans to go to the diverging diamond, it would be silly to build pedestrian expansion. We should build vehicle expansions that we may use for pedestrians initially, and then when we go to the diverging diamond, it can support it. Well, in addition to which, it's going to take so long, as you said, to go through the process to get the final approval to do the double line. Uh, right. Uh, you know, and if one of the issues is let's do double left because we can get it and go on, we get in phase two. But it's you not going to solve the problem. To me, it, it doesn't, it doesn't solve a long-term problem. I'd rather go through the process of, of trying to get the funding. Take the time and the energy. And, the, and, 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 and do it right and not rush it through and get, mm -hmm. get things. Well, the reality is that the Northeast Loop doesn't doesn't solve the town center problem either. Well, yes, it does. Well, it does. When, well, does it solve the problem? It doesn't solve the weave problem. It doesn't solve stuff. We, the weave problem wasn't on the on the table in terms of the north. No, but, but, yeah. but to Fred's point about about trying to take into consideration the future development of the town center and the the connectivity to to transit and all those types of things, we should be if we're looking holistically at this, the northeast loop doesn't fix that either. Is that fair to say? Yeah, if we so were really, really the best solution that fit that does address this is the, the diverging time. Yeah, right. right. I've, I've, looked at, I've looked at a number of permutations on solving that weed problem, and I haven't found a, a real good solution. Mm -hmm. This is the, the most promising one that, right. I, that I've seen. So we haven't had that opportunity in the past. And if that's, to me, that's a perception. That there's a real problem with that weave, the accidents are, are not showing that. But I think there's a real perception. And then the town center comes in. We're really going to ag aggravate that particular issue. It almost seems like you need to bring the town center traffic out, up the Caslin, away, yes. rather than here, just <laughs> to give that room to. Because you end up with you know with longer backups and. Well, there are accesses along the castle and that's, you know, in the old plan, but I'm sure we'll continue that. And in the comp plan, we'll continue to either ratify those, those intersections or not, but they're, they're south and there's, so there are ways 
-hmm. once you're in the town center to get to the chasm other than coming to Marshall Road or the extension of Marshall Road or, or the or or even well Cold Creek Drive isn't in that mix but Marshall Road is so there's other intersections down there it's not as though that's the only one yeah, so we so have to get into the town center via Cold Creek true mm -hmm. yeah at some point but it, well, it's the exiting the town center that creates the problem. But right. Right. but if you're in the south southern part of the town center, you're probably not going to go up to this intersection. You're going to get on somewhere the chasm somewhere else, further to the south on one of those other options. Yeah. At first, though, I mean, if the core is developed first and then <coughs> around the extension of Marshall Road here, yeah, that's there's going to be a lot of activity there until the southern parts begin to develop and people say, heck. I'm going to get on the chasm by getting that other intersection down there. It's much easier. Yeah. Especially those who live there, if they're going to live there. Okay, I guess we talked ourselves in. Hmm. Well, I don't know if I don't So, okay. I guess I said that. I'm torn. It would be nice to have a uh, sort of a concise or a definitive a, statement a definitive of some sort. Definitive statement or a recommendation because that's uh, what you can do. Want to do a resolution. You know, again, in terms of the timing, because I heard that, um, again, if this is a resolution, you know, a recommendation you pass on and say proceed post haze to try to move this forward and, and get the DDI approved, I mean, it could be possible to get it in phase one. But, uh, you know, who knows? CDOT might latch onto it and fast track it through the process. Sure. Yes, yeah, they're excited to get one of these in. That's, that's yeah, another yeah. benefit. I mean, they may try to move it. They might even. And if, our, if RTD is excited about it, who knows? Right. We don't know where they're coming from. So uh, if we're hesitant oh, to yeah, you get, you get a cool project. Yeah. If we're hesitant about it, then they, you know, again, a united front looks a whole, whole lot better. <laughs> they might all be watching. Just. <laughs> 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 uh, what my, you think well, my concerns alleviated through the second part of our discussion here, so I, I guess I'm more on board with the diverging diamond and, and skipping the double left as, as potentially unnecessary. We think the preferred alternative is the diverging diamond. Mm -hmm. Tom, do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. yeah, so with, with, with the pedestrian, with the, with the expansion of the bridge to support pedestrians right. down the center. Central pedestrian. Central. Accessibility. I think at that's least, our only. At least six of the seven commissioners are. <laughs> 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 I'm fine with as, that. As a preferred, at least we'll as a preferred drive alternative. We'll drive a couple of times, okay? <laughs> as, as God the, willing. As the preferred alternative because because it addresses not only the the the, the movements on onto and off of 36, but also. Um, Somewhat addresses the other concerns we have related mm -hmm. to McCaslin and Marshall and the, the weave and that. Mm -hmm. But and our concerns about the diverging diamond, though, in the design is that the pedestrian, um, the pedestrian movements are addressed specifically, ideally by allowing for the um, pedestrians to to have only two. You know, two crossings, which would mean that you need to put them down the middle, and that may add cost. So, what I have is uh, support the diverging diamond alternative with the provision of providing pet bike access in the middle of a widened bridge. Yeah, correct. I think that's it. Do we need a vote? Are we still we'll formulate like that in the motion? <laughs> Is that a, a, Do we need is that a resolution or is that a... Well, it's a recommendation. I, it's a recommendation. It's a recommendation. Yeah. Yeah, I you? looked at the code. Mm -hmm. When we did this, um, I looked at the code and it said for uh, plan developments and stuff that we would do a resolution. Okay. Okay. It doesn't say anything in there about major improvements. Right. So I was, when I talked to Matt, it was like it would be just a recommendation. Do we, do we need to vote on the recommendation? Do you want to vote? Do you want to... I think it was pretty clear. I, I you know. I can 
say that there's a consensus support. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the recommendation. Yeah. The recommendation is to go forward with the diversion diamond with with all Destrian Center. Yeah. Destrian yeah. access to the center. Yeah. Take a vote if you want, John. No, I, I mean, I think we're... Consensus. Head Consensus. nods are good. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're fine. Sure. I don't think we need to yeah. vote on what we're saying. Okay. Okay? Okay. Okay. I mean, if you guys feel there are any other comments related to the other alternatives that are relevant that you think we should say, you know, we didn't think the double left, that the double left really addressed. Um, How about after extensive discussion? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let it go to that. <laughs> well, I was, I was simply, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what you want to give the town board, but you guys can pull out points out of the discussion. I think the discussion about the double left not really buying as much. No, it doesn't solve any problem doesn't solve the serious problem and any serious problems that we have today and it also doesn't it's, solve it's, it's the true. issue when the town center gets built so yeah, it's really uh, it's, 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 it's just a band-aid yeah, yeah. yeah. Was was an, expensive band -aid. an expensive band-aid that on a minor cut so. yeah i'd say double left is not buying much over the long term for the, for the town right and we also think that Lewis feels chicken for not That's why I was making it Would you please bang your gavel? Can we yeah. go home? We can. Absolutely. <laughs> um, any other staff announcements? Uh, well, the only one uh, I have is that we uh, raised right now is that we had our first meeting, the joint board meeting, planning commission meeting just last night. We talked about the, the comp plan people threw uh, issues out on the table. We, we talked most about the, the map you might have gotten in your packet with the, the uh, different areas on the map where there may be potential for change. We talked about, about those areas and, and uh, threw some more items on the table for the consultants to, to start dealing with. The next meeting, I believe, is uh, with the community. And I think I should have brought my schedule, but I believe it's May 2nd. I'm not quite second sure. Or third. Second or third. Second or yeah. third, something like that. So, uh, and then there was other discussion about uh, how to get the message out to folks in town, and uh, and so they're going to use the, the the media outlets that you have, Facebook and so on. So they're going to the, they will start tying into that. So you may be starting to see things pop up on the website. Um, I think in the next meetings they're going to bring some more some of the large maps so that they, you know if we start talking about certain areas where we're not dealing with the scale that we have to put you know, use our magnifying glass to look at. So, uh, I thought the meeting was 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 productive. We started six and ended at eight fifteen, something like that. So, can I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at that schedule so you'll know when the next dates are for the joint PC and board meetings. And I I put them on my calendar today and I absolutely can't remember what they were. But I think it's the next one is in May yeah. and then June. So July. June there's two, I know that. There's the community meeting. Oh, oh yeah, there's and I think so there's two, two a month. Yeah, there's two a month. But it, yeah, if you'll look at that you know, look calendar, at that. so you'll be can, aware. Can we get those on the website soon? Because I, I mean, I checked the calendar today. I was trying to communicate this to people on the website, but they aren't on the calendar okay. yet, okay. and they ought to be. I mean, we're all starting to talk to people about it, and I can't remember when the dates all are. Okay, I will pass that on. Thanks. Yeah, they'll, and I, you know, I, you know, I think they'll kick in. The consultants will kick in pretty quick here on some of that. I mean, we've got the schedule, so yep. no one really objected to it. There's going to be conflicts all along because it's summer for everybody uh, as time goes on. But you know, we've got a schedule to stick to it. Those who can make it, make it, and then try to catch up if you can because you're out of town. Is there any chance that they'll televise the community meetings? Do you know? I have no idea. 
Um, as long as they're here, they might, but uh, even last night's was not televised. But right? if they're held at the school, I don't think we have that capacity. I thought the way that it was set up last night was it gave plenty of room for other folks to be here, but this room can handle more than you think, um, even when we use the table as a, as a, a, a way to communicate using the, the table arrangement rather than you know, this kind of arrangement. So there is still quite a bit of room for others to join in, I thought. So I, I, I think we'll, my thought is, We'll, we'll see how we go, but I think we continue to use this room, and maybe we can take advantage of that and put it on TV. Okay. Yeah. Wrong I can pass that on too. Yeah. 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 As long as we use this room. Um, the other thing is the board will discuss the an agreement for going forward with the uh, a rezoning plan for the. Town Center on the north half, which would be the north 80 acres, which is basically Medkick and uh, Whale on properties. That discussion will be next Monday. Is that the correct? Yes. Yes. So you may want to follow that. Because if they do, and they go forward, you all, <laughs> down the line here, or July, probably somewhere, August, somewhere in there, would be looking at it, you know. Formal way, but there will be an as part of the schedule. I saw there's also an informal part in there where we, as the planning commission, look at it, throw suggestions at it, give them feedback before they submit. So there's a so that's a good thing. Okay. Anyway, that's that's coming up, and that'll that means we're going to be fairly busy. Okay. okay. Thanks, because we are adjourned.